You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Aaron Corbett, I'm so glad to have you on this episode. Thanks, buddy. I'm pretty excited to be on this one. Yeah, this is a this is a cool one, and I I, I really wanted to have you to get that local perspective. I wanted to have two people who knew this store. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, because you went to a different high school than me, but Big Ben's Convenience Store, I think I had lunch there at least three times a week for like the three years that I was in high school. Like, you know this store pretty well? Oh, yeah. This store to me was the Halloween store. The cool, the, One of the most exciting things about Halloween, the weeks leading up, would be the display window at Big Ben's. There'd be all these really dark, scary, like really elaborate masks in the window. And I always liked every year seeing what they had up in the window. Yeah, it was, I, I kind of forgot about that. But I did the same. My dad would take me there, not even to shop for masks. No, just, just to, to look. look at what they yeah. had. And they, they must have, like the owner must have had some kind of connection or something. Because they weren't like the typical masks you'd see for sale. They were like high end, like kind of like silicone. Yeah, like you could imagine today ordering paying $500 for them off Amazon or something, you know, they were kind of like really, I don't know where, you know, in the early nineties you would get masks like that, but Mm -hmm. every year they always had about 30 or 40 of them displayed up and it was always really exciting to go in and not necessarily buy them because they're pricier, but Mm -hmm. um, just to look at them, it was, it was cool. Yeah. Now, just to, you've been on the show before, Aaron, but let's uh, let's remind people of of who you are. I'll in, I would introduce you as Aaron Corbett, my good friend who we shared a band airport with for many years, and you have a, a strong background in theater and the performing arts. Tell us a, tell us a bit more than that, though. Uh, yeah. So you and I go back musically. We had a band together. I was the lead singer um, slash songwriter. You were the lead guitar player, and yeah, and I, I've been performing and, and writing and directing for the theater for most of my life. And that's kind of most of the things that I do. And every now and then I get to pop on your podcast and talk yeah. about something weird. Yeah, and, and like true crime is not really your thing. But nope. with this story, like, it's not really like you know this story because you're into true crime. You know the story because like me, it was a really big deal and, you know, some of our formative years like do you remember this going down oh yeah because it was pretty around the same time as the mcdonald's murders right yeah it was just months earlier yeah so it was kind of a a violent time in the island where no we we weren't used to where i wasn't anyway because i would have been around 12 at the time and i wasn't used to hearing about really violent crimes in the area and and especially at at a place that i would go to you know, mm-hmm. uh, fairly often, a place I was really familiar with, a place, you know, a store I've been in a bunch, and you're just like, wow, someone was stabbed there. That's it, it kind of uh, grounds you and really uh, makes you kind of realizing that it can happen anywhere, it can happen anytime, and it can happen to anybody. Yeah, because it's like we're from a, a pretty small town. I don't know the population of Sydney, which is on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. I think at I don't know why 30,000 comes to mind. I think the main city of Sydney was around maybe in the early 90s, around 25 or 30,000. That's just okay. total guesswork. But for people listening, like you would know Sydney as basically your typical small town in Canada. Mm-hmm. And the Big Ben's convenience store is your typical late night convenience store that you can, you know, get cigarettes or, uh, you know, big bag of candy for a couple dollars or something Mm -hmm. they sell magazines and ice cream and halloween masks like we talked about you know in our town and this all happened in 92 is like people who listen to my show likely will recall the series on the mcdonald's murder that happened only months after the story we're going to talk about and the story we're going to talk about was still hadn't been solved at the time of the McDonald's murders. So there was, there was a lot of fear kind of throughout Sydney because people like weren't used to, you know, hardcore violent crime. And this story we're going to be talking about is pretty intense. So it's this, I, I, I remember when all this was going down big time because like, just like you, this was my kind of neighborhood convenience store, mm-hmm. but also I had a weird connection to it where my grandfather, who you've met lots of times, Papa yeah. Eddie, mm-hmm. uh, he's been on my show before too. Papa Eddie lived like 
just like across the street and up a few houses from the Big Ben's uh, convenience store. And the morning that this crime went down, my papa heard the um, uh, police sirens and all that. And he actually was one of the first people on the scene. He walked. Um, oh, no way. He, yeah, he was up early in the morning when this happened and heard the sirens and stuff. And we'll get into it as we talk, cause, but it was like a really bad snowstorm that night. Mm-hmm. And he um, he walked over to see what was happening and to see if he can help. And when he walked over, he was kind of met with um, – the way he described it to me, There was just they were just putting up the police tape. And he saw, you know, like blood all over the floor and stuff and, you know, knew something mm-hmm. horrible had happened. But um, so so this story, it's – it's kind of been extra personal for me because it's a store, a store I know well, and also granddad was involved in it in that way. But um, anyway, we should, uh, I think we've, we've set it up enough and we're, we're ready to jive into it. So what do you say we tell this thing? Let's do it. We'll pick up the story and start in around 1988. Uh, a family, uh, they're called the Dupes. It was a, a husband and wife, Doug and Marie. Mm-hmm. They retired and moved to Cape Breton um, for to live out their retirement years and didn't really seem to have a, a whole lot of a plan to, as, as to why they were going to be there. It seems like they just kind of moved back to Cape Breton to kind of enjoy a simple life. But for whatever reason, Marie Dupe, his, his wife, um, decided to take a job at the Big Ben's convenience store. It mm-hmm. wasn't until 92 that she took the job. So at this point, she's been in Cape Breton for four years. But Yeah, basically she uh, was sitting at home a lot probably and getting uh, kind of restless and wanted to at least have a part-time job maybe to, to just to keep busy. Yeah, and and I've lived in Cape Breton and in Sydney during the winter, and there's just like in the summer there's a bit going on, but in the winter mm-hmm. there's just not much activity. So I can see her being like, you know, I'm gonna use some of my time to make a bit of extra money, and right. you know, and Big Ben's convenience store would be the kind of place where if you needed a job, you could probably walk in there with a resume and start that night. I always remember seeing, especially after what happened, mm-hmm. always a, a, a job ad in the Cape Breton Post for. Hmm. Um, for Big Ben's, especially after this, they couldn't, I imagine, had quite a hard time uh, getting anyone to stay. Um, yes, especially backshift. Yeah. Yeah, especially the backshift. So we'll treat that as a bit of foreshadowing. So basically, she starts um, working there in February of 92, uh, working casually, kind of part-time, here and there type, type shift work. But the event that would get her discussed on this podcast would be um it will take us to march 21st of 92 so at this point just working there for about a month and on february 21st 92 she was asked to do her first back shift which is basically like this is a convenience store that was open all night 24 hours a day Mm -hmm. so the back shift i'm guessing she probably would have shown up for work around 8 p.m and would have worked you know the entire night serving Probably uh, people who are out in the middle of the night that need to stop in for cigarettes or maybe some people stumbling home from the bar. But this back shift wasn't going to be the regular back shift uh, because of the weather that day. And I'm sure you read about this. So tell us about what was what was going on in the in the skies above Cape Breton that night. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it was there was a major snowstorm on this night, which plays pretty heavily into the story. Um, I think they, uh, I read or saw something that it was uh, maybe thirty centimeters of snow. Yeah, that's that's what I that's what I recall was they were expecting thirty centimeters, which would have been a, probably the worst storm or among the worst storms of the season. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there was also forecast that beyond the snow was was going to be a lot of wind, so it was going to be just one of those nights where you aren't going to leave your house or don't want to. Yeah, And I, I think her husband even um, encouraged her not to go, encouraged her to take the night off. You know, the weather's going to be too bad. Um, yeah, because this was her first back shift, I think. Yeah, and and I wonder if she didn't want to maybe upset her boss or maybe she's just like, oh, to hell with it. I'll just, you know, I'll, I'm going to go in anyway. But yeah, some people are, I'm not one of these people that is, that is stubborn in that way. If it's, if the roads are gross, I'll, I'll catch you another time. Yeah. 
uh, especially a back shift at a convenience store. I would be scared to do that anyway, but maybe that's me because of this crime happening in my childhood. I, the idea of working back shift just freaks me out. But mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, she she wasn't scared and she decided to go in and do it. Yeah. In the story, really from there, I guess we can jump ahead with at about 4 a.m. in the morning. And I kind of teased this with uh, mentioning my granddad showing up. Shortly before my granddad heard the sirens at about 4 a.m., someone walked into the store. And this is, again, at the height of the blizzard. Um, and uh, they walked into the store. But what they found was Marie Dupe laying at the back of the store, um, gasping for breath. She was still alive at this point when she was found. But she was in brutal, brutal shape. She had been stabbed i read over 40 times including slices like her her face and her ear was removed and her throat was slashed but she was still alive at this point however she didn't have much time left i, I believe when it, within less than an hour of being found she was she was pronounced dead When I was looking at some pictures of it uh, and the blood on the floor, I, I, I feel like it's the same flooring that's still in there today. I, You know what? I think it is too. And I think I saw the same pictures. It's this kind of brown brick. And I, re yeah. I remember the, the floor because especially, and actually this will play into the story, but especially in the winter time, when you go in there, if you have a bit of like snow on your shoes, your oh, boots it collects. or whatever, yeah. it collects and the floor gets really kind of like slippery mm -hmm. and and weird but like i guess we should to to describe the crime scene i'm going to describe the interior of the the convenience store a little bit is it's it's your typical convenience store where they're selling magazines and ice cream and candy and cigarettes but they kind of have this that i think they call it a lunch counter when i was in high school anyway there was two tables that had like four seats each yeah and then there was a little spot next to that where you could like pour a coffee or they had like um in a little fridge like subs or sandwiches or whatever you can buy her in i should also say back in high school i was a cigarette smoker so at lunch <laughs> we used to lunch from high school we would just go sit there at these tables and we would just smoke and eat our whatever lunch we had packed so this was kind of like my spot which is pretty weird but she was um she was found right there in the section of the lunch counter um, in, uh, again, gasping for breath when she when she passed away. Yeah. And it's not it's not a big, like huge convenience store or like a big restaurant. It's like so these are like kind of tight aisles and there's like they say like two two small tables uh, to sit at. Um, you know, and just kind of things to microwave up for to eat. Yeah, but. and it, it's so small that like when you're sitting at those tables, your back is almost against like uh, a shelf of bags of chips. Like, so it's, yeah, it's, it's... I think it was really up against where the milk and everything is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like a chain convenience store; like it's a mm -hmm. local. You know, nothing is is designed in a in a consistent way. It's. It's just, here's a space, here's a bunch of shelves, and here's just a bunch of stuff to buy. Yeah, one thing they do have at the store, which may give a, an idea of how casually it's put together and run. To this day, they have, um, near the door, there's a, a binder, and it's basically like a most wanted list. And as you flip through the binder, it's photos from the CCTV cameras they have of mm -hmm. people shoplifting. Have you ever seen this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I was in there once and I like, this is maybe two years ago and I was flipping through it and it's just, yeah, it'll be like a, a photo of somebody with their hand in the, mm. like in the bulk candy or whatever. And it's, I think what they want is people to write the name of the shoplifter underneath the pictures, but mm. you, you wouldn't really see that sort of thing at like a, a Needs or a 7-Eleven or any of these types of No, chains. no. Because they're constantly, constantly dealing with at least shoplifting um and then sometimes more serious stuff but like what happened to marie dupe in the the middle of the night mm -hmm. so we'll get into now a, a bit about the at least the initial investigation so again where we're at is at 4 a.m somebody walks in there and finds her uh, murdered basically and the police arrive and they do their their initial on scene investigation, and there really wasn't a whole lot that they managed to find in the convenience store. For for one, it's I mentioned like the snowstorm that 
disguised any track. So whoever was in there and left, any tracks that they left were long gone. Mm-hmm. So there's no, there's nothing showing w- which direction they would have left. As well as when the police show up, And all the people are coming and going. I had already described this, but they were bringing in a lot of snow and salt and stuff on their boots that once they were getting inside there, it was melting and putting water on the floor. You know, and and DNA was not really like, you know, using DNA in an investigation was either super new or really not used at all at the time. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, maybe especially around uh, Cape Breton. But so... uh, when they were going in to do the initial investigation, I doubt that they were strategically, you know, looking out for DNA evidence at the time. Yeah. Like now in our like present day world, you would treat, I think you would, I think anyway, you would treat a crime scene a lot more delicately because we Mm -hmm. understand the concept of DNA, but that was, that was like an emerging science in 92. But yeah, but regardless Anytime they'd open the door, a gust of snow would come in. Anytime a cop came or went, more water was coming in and it was just creating a mess in there. But really the only thing that they managed to find that eventually would be very important is the little table that I sat at having lunch in high school that she was laying nearly dead next to. There was an ashtray on the on the little table that had a couple cigarette butts in it and there was an, a half empty cup of coffee. So they bagged that as evidence, thinking it could have something to do with the crime, but it wouldn't come into play till several years later. Oh yeah, much later. (laughs) Yeah, that that was the on scene the on scene investigation. But in the days after the the investigation really took a turn, whereas they focused heavily on Marie's husband, Doug. Do you want to talk about that? Oh yeah. Well with this is the part that I always get and and maybe uh, you know i'm looking at it at a completely twisted lens but you know when when when, it, when there's no one else when when there's no evidence to point directly to somebody and say that's definitely the person or probably the person kind of the person they go to next or usually first is the boyfriend or the husband or or the wife or you know it's 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 kind of i always had this kind of dark fear in the back of my mind that one day I'm going to come home and my wife trip down the stairs, but you know, I'm going to be taken out in handcuffs for some reason, but that's kind of what I think about. Cause they kind of started to, to go towards him and there was a lot of rumors going around about him and why they came from away to live here when they really didn't have a connection to the Island. And, and I remember hearing that like the, 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 kind of the rumor mill started where these two people had come from from an out of out of the, off of the island and retired here but what quickly began to happen was people were saying maybe they were escaping maybe they were involved in organized crime mm-hmm. in another city maybe he's involved in moving drugs and that went from i i expect it went from people kind of questioning their history to people using it to describe their history. So all of a sudden, the police very quickly were inundated with tips related to Doug and Marie um, having escaped organized crime and this murder either to be a, a hit or revenge or something of that nature. But it really led to Doug Dupe being grilled. He was actually oh, polygraphed twice. twice. Yeah, that's right. And passed both both times. <laughs> And, yeah, and they, they found nothing. They've never found anything to link him no. or her to any kind of illegal activity or crime. It seems to be purely a, a rumor mill, basically, who, who that started that, which is pretty unfortunate. And that's a total Cape Breton thing to do when somebody oh, yeah. comes from away. People always kind of smile to their face and welcome them. But then maybe... You know, as they turn their back, they start to gossip about them right away, which I'm sure is the case with any smaller kind of town. Um, Absolutely. It's got this like kind of like xenophobic kind of vibe where it's very much like on Cape Breton Island. It's the people who like kind of the locals. It's like they, you know, their grandparents and their great grandparents and, and everyone's so connected that when someone from the outside comes in, they just... um they kind of got to earn their spot. And yeah, I, and I think that's 
you know, any small town anywhere, I'm sure, has a lot of the same thing. The same kind of mentality. And um, yeah, like you say, it can take a while for someone to kind of gain the trust of the locals. And because this was such an, a crime that, that we weren't used to around here, and this was a couple from away, it was just this really unfortunate mix of, of uh, small town gossip and, and fear that was really uh, fueling all of these rumors that were being cooked up about this couple about organized crime and yeah know. and it, it, what's what's interesting too for people who know the story of the mcdonald's murder which happened i think a little over a month after this is a lot of the same rumors and and such that fueled the search for whoever was responsible for the mcdonald's murders it was the same with this is that they were suspecting it was you know some biker gang from off the island came in and did this sort of thing and i, I think it was maybe the people of cape breton trying to separate themselves from any connection to this type of violence because this was you know these two crimes the McDonald's murders and the Big Ben's murders that happened within you know a month or two of each other still to this day are like Cape Breton's two of Cape Breton's darkest moments. I can't think of many other you know murders that have this kind of profile. Not this kind of profile because you're talking about the early '90s too when televised news is is more of a thing around here. Like I think we had a our own news station at the time that. Uh, you know, so it was a bit more publicized. I'm sure there was probably gruesome murders, you know, a hundred years ago or whenever that just didn't have the coverage uh, because the you know technology wasn't there. But in the early '90s, there was a um, bit more televised news happening in the area. Mm -hmm. So, getting back to the story here, so once uh, Doug went through his two polygraphs and was in essence cleared as a suspect. The police then really had to get down to some old school investigative tactics. And I really dig this aspect of the investigation. What they did was to try to find who was in the store that night. They've got a list of all of the different purchases made during her shift and began tracking down the people responsible for those purchases to kind of put who was going to be at the scene and, and not, in, which is must have been pretty time consuming and difficult. Today it wouldn't be too hard because everybody I would sure I'm sure would be using like debit or credit. But back then in 92 it probably was a bit more complicated than that. And and I'm sure I mean I don't know what the situation was with security cameras at the time. Like was there anything to do with security cameras in early 90s at Big Ben's? There must not have been because that I've not never heard anything mentioning security cameras be it well that would have been the main evidence in this case if there was oh, security I, cameras absolutely it would have been like oh we'll just check the cameras there he is uh it would have been as as simple as that but it's i never yeah i never thought of that that is kind of shocking that they would have somebody a, a, a lone person working a back shift in a convenience store near downtown sydney in a, a snowstorm without uh without cameras but Maybe it's crimes like this that led to the, the prominence of, of cameras that we see today. Because that is another small town mentality of like, we leave our doors unlocked and we, nothing like that ever happens around here. So there's not a need for security cameras. But then all of a sudden something crazy like this happens and you're like, why didn't we have security cameras up? Yeah, well, without the cameras, they still managed to put together basically every purchase that was made that night. Uh, there was only one purchase that they couldn't find the person responsible for. It was, again, keep in mind of the timeline is she was found at 4 a.m. The purchase that they couldn't track down was a 3.16 a.m. purchase of a pack of cigarettes, the More Lights. They found every other purchase. That was the second last purchase of the night. The, the last purchase was only two minutes later it was at 3.18 a.m., so two minutes after the cigarettes were purchased, uh, somebody purchased a sub, a sub sandwich. <laughs> and yeah. this person, when they found her, the, the person who made the 3.18 sub sandwich, what she had to say about what was going on in the store really, really changed the, the scope of the investigation. The guy that was just standing over there at the table, he was just like, 
not moving. It was like a statue. And the only movement that you seen out of him was like when he was having a, a puff of a cigarette or when he went to lift up his coffee cup. Other than that, he was like a statue. He didn't move. And uh, I had asked the lady, I said, does, does he bother you? And she said, well, yeah, he's creeping me out a little bit. I said, well, maybe you should call the police because like he seems a little, you know what I mean, spaced out. The mystery man would now take on the attention of the investigators. They would begin their hunt for this guy, knowing very little beyond what the woman who purchased the sub had had described. They did do a couple of those drawings, like the police drawings, and I remember seeing them. I think they were they were up around town or in the paper or something, but it really went nowhere. They ended up interviewing like this was a big investigation. They ended up interviewing over 200 people. And I'm thinking the investigation probably got kind of kicked in the butt a little bit or maybe maybe knocked over a little bit when the McDonald's murders happened because it was like they, we're talking about a small town police force. So they yeah. likely didn't have the, the resources to, to kind of cover two huge cases like that. Yeah. But in the end, they did about 200 interviews, as I said, and then it was basically just a, a wait and see. We didn't hear anything for for years um, after this. Actually, one other thing that we missed, the only other piece of evidence was at the end of the oh, winter. Oh, yes. The, me the snow melted and they found the knife. Mm -hmm. They found the murder weapon at the... Um, so again, she was murdered in March. It was around the end of April, I believe, that the by this time they've identified, you know, wanting to talk to this mystery man. Doug Dupe had been ruled out as a suspect. The snow banks melt and they find just outside of the convenience store, they find um a, they described it as a sandwich knife, which I'm guessing is just kind of like a steak knife. That's how it looked. That's how I would describe it. They described it in everything I read or, or watched. They described it as a steak knife. But I think what it probably was was, again, those tables in the in the convenience store were near the section where you'd buy a sub and make a coffee and whatnot. I'm guessing this was probably just a knife they had on that counter for yeah. you know people who needed it. Yeah, it just to, makes sense. Also to to cut the bags for the for the um, pizza burgers. Yeah, to get yeah that mm, sort of so thing. So they put so. them in the microwave. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so this happens. They have basically all the evidence they're going to get at this point. They have cigarette butts and a coffee cup in a police locker somewhere for possible future evidentiary use. They have a mystery man they want to find. They know the murder weapon. And they basically ruled out their initial suspect of her husband, Doug Dupe. Seven years later, science would blow this case wide open when... DNA science advances to a point that it's now practical to reopen cold cases and re-examine some evidence. So they had a, a, I can't think, I think it was called the Canadian National DNA Data Bank had been created about about seven years, I believe, after she was she was murdered, and they basically any like a criminal or whatever or or anyone that they're looking for evidence related to or whatever they would have this dna profile in this data bank but what ended up happening was the the dna associated with the cigarette butts in the coffee cup were just sitting in that database waiting for a match when they would yeah you know, when they pulled the dna from it they found no match no profile it's just sitting there waiting for you know some random person to match up with it and create like a you know a hit or whatever but it had sat there for about 2 years until a guy in Toronto um he was arrested and charged with i think it was like assault causing bodily harm i don't know the details of this crime yeah but me it was, either but it was like obviously not on the scale of um you know what happened at, at Big Ben's, but um, it was it was some crime that he was picked up for, and his DNA was entered into the system and matched, you know, with this cigarette butt. Yeah, exactly. So police uh, in Cape Breton would have just gotten, you know, a, probably a phone call or I don't know if email would have been a thing in two thousand and one. I think it would have been. Oh but yeah, that, it was. Uh, I had a hotmail address in two thousand one. 
Mm-hmm. I probably did too. I just I have no concept of how much time has passed since I turned nineteen, but it's uh, but whatever had happened, they uh, whichever means that happened, they received basically a notice saying, you know, we found a match for the DNA on those cigarettes in that cup. It was a twenty eight year old man named Ernest Strobridge at the time living in Toronto, but originally from Newfoundland. Uh, again, he had been charged with um, assault causing bodily harm, and a part of the sentencing for that was the judge uh, required his DNA be added to this data bank. So, as so, that's kind of what led to his downfall. They very quickly looked into this guy, knowing you know this is likely that mystery man, and th- what they've learned was that at the time of Marie Dupes' murder, the Big Ben's murders, he lived only a couple blocks away. He lived in that end of Sydney. So right away, it was, you know, bells and whistles were going off. And they, I'm sure right from the very beginning, knew that this was probably their guy. Yeah. And he, he bears some resemblance, to, uh, a little bit of resemblance to the, the drawings. Um, not a, not a ton, but like some. I I found when I looked at it anyway. Yeah, he had he had similar features, but I find those police drawings oh, are never they're, yeah they're, they're never very. There's good. always um, either the upper half is like oddly distorted or the lower half, but like I can't imagine trying to describe your face to someone and having them draw it out. Like I, I wouldn't mm-hmm. be able to come even close. Even I've seen you a thousand times. Yeah, I don't I don't know how people could do it, especially someone you only saw once, and that. Like, I guess they're probably good for giving a general idea, especially for someone who has a real prominent feature. Like he had, you know, black curly hair and glasses. Right. <laughs> you could just put a picture of a guy with yeah. black curly hair and glasses. But, but all she, it would take is... The, that yeah. witness really focused on his eyes. She mm-hmm. said that his eyes were... she There was something about his eyes that she didn't like. And, and she really focused on that. And she... The police asked her early on in the investigation if... She, after the, the the pictures were drawn, if she would be able to pick this person out of a lineup. And she said, once I see the eyes, I'm definitely going to be able to pick this guy out. Mm-hmm. Well, she didn't have to because DNA did it for her. And now what comes next is the police in Toronto, where Ernest Strobridge is living, and the police in Cape Breton, they decide to collaborate knowing that, you know, they have one chance to make this happen. The, the DNA only puts them at the scene, but that's not going to get them a conviction. They know that they're going into this knowing we need a confession. And that's really when things get interesting. It sounds like um, a, a major like FBI thing. What they do is uh, they come up with something. They're calling it Project Phoenix. And it's basically one of the more controversial police tactics that uh, that happen in Canada where people typically call it the Mr. Big Sting. This is something that it's not even legal in a lot of countries. I, I know the United States uh, doesn't allow this, but in Canada, the Mr. Big Sting has been used for several high profile convictions. Um, to, why don't you, I know you you pay a lot of attention to the Mr. Big kind of controversy. Tell us a bit about in, in general what it is, and then we'll talk about what they did for Strobridge. So the Mr. Big Sting, as we'll, as we'll call it, um, that's kind of the, the nickname for it, I guess. But it was invented by the RCMP in the early 90s, hmm. um, maybe the late 80s, maybe the early 90s, somewhere in that time frame. But the, it's, it's totally the concoction of the RCMP. Um, and for any American listeners, the RCMP is basically like uh, one of the main police kind of services in Canada, similar, I guess, maybe to the FBI or something like that. Um, but yeah, so what happens is they have someone that they need to get a confession from. And this, this takes months and months of, of, of work and, and writing and, and acting. And there's a lot of like theatricalness to it. It's a lot of undercover stuff where they gain, they, they meet up undercover with the suspect and they make them believe that this uh, pol- undercover police officer is part of like a, maybe a crime organization. And they start kind of ga- bringing the, the suspect who they're trying to get the confession from into this fictitious crime or family or organization. They start giving them smaller jobs, um, you know, like bring this package here or or steal this or, you know, um, 
kind of kind of various kind of tasks for them to do. And then eventually, um, as they kind of uh, gain the trust of this individual, they're going to introduce them to the, the major crime boss, the Mr. Big character. And that Mr. Big character is going to get them to confess about a murder or a serious crime that they've committed in order to be able to know that they can trust that person. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, I guess, the quickest way I can explain it. Yeah. It, it sounds crazy, but it works all the time. There's been numerous major conf- major cases that were cracked with this. And the way they did it specifically with Strobridge is, so again, they target him as this is the guy we want, we, we think's involved. We want to, you know, get him and get him involved in this Mr. Big Sting. Uh, he had an outstanding warrant for possession of stolen property. So what they decided to do was arrest him and bring him to the station and whatnot for this outstanding warrant of uh, possession of stolen property. But while they're bringing him to the station, they had in the back of uh, not a police car, but like a, a police van. They had an undercover cop sitting there playing the part of like some other person who was just arrested. So when when Strobridge is in the car with him, this undercover cop is, you know, just talking to him, probably saying things like what they get you for, you know, that sort of thing. Um, Strobridge goes into the police station and does whatever happens when you're arrested for an outstanding warrant. But what they did was when they released him from the station, they the undercover cop that was arrested with him um, was released at the same time. So as they're walking out together, the undercover cop continues the conversation with Strobridge, basically saying, like, you know, if you you want to make some money, man, like I got uh, I got an in and I can get you some I can get you some work. Do you want to you know come work with me? Strobridge agrees to do it. And in the months after that, I I think they spent about two months on him. What they were doing was this undercover cop playing the character of another, you know, small town or small time criminal would get Strobridge to do this, these random tasks, like let's steal a car. But really what it is, is it's one of the cops cars and they just pretend to steal it. All of it is written out. Like they, they even show like um, on some of the documentaries I watched, all the different like scenarios that they could possibly do. Like they're written out almost like a script is like Mm -hmm. we, we meet him here and then we talk about this and then we, we have the car show up at this time and it's like almost so planned out and and Mm -hmm. takes so much man hours and so much time, like months and months of just planting all these seeds, like very, very patiently. And it's expensive because they're paying him. So, and they're paying him well. So let's say they'll steal a car or fake stealing a car and they'll give him a thousand bucks. And then they'll ask him to deliver a package. It's, you know, saying it's drugs or something and they'll give him 500 bucks. And, you know, you stand guard on this place overnight and we'll give you some money. And slowly he's making good money. He gains their trust. And then this guy says, you know, Mr. Big wants to meet with you at a hotel. They obviously didn't say Mr. Big. They said, you know, whatever his name is, the leader of our crime organization wants to meet with you. Uh, Strobridge would have made some good money at this point and probably went into this thinking this was, you know, the job interview of his lifetime. Um, and now comes one of the more Another one of the more fascinating parts of this uh, is Strobridge goes to this hotel and meets with who he thinks is the head of this mob family that he's been or crime family that he's been working for for the last few months. Really, what he's doing is he's sitting down with just a different undercover cop. And I'll play a bit of the audio. You're going to hear the undercover cop playing the part of a mob boss, basically describing to Strobridge the need for Strobridge to give them some information about something he did in the past to kind of level the playing field because Strobridge knows what this criminal family's up to. They want to know something about him. That way they're all in the same playing field and they can trust each other. Yeah. You know why you're up here tonight. I wanted to uh, to meet you. Maybe it's possible that you can uh, come into our little family which I'm very much hope to. Once we kind of bear our souls to you, we're exposed. And, uh, and there's got to be a trade-off. Yeah. I would go to the, to the thing called the uh, Big Benz murder. Big Benz? Yeah. Mercedes Benz? No. It's by a convenience store on Princess Street. 
and I, I didn't realize I'd done it until like the next day because I, I, I blacked out and then when I woke up the next day I was covered from its own blood. Okay, you kind of lost me. What, what are we talking about? Uh, well, there was a murder there. Yeah, and I done it. Well, that's pretty heavy. All I remember seeing is that she, she was flashing around this knife. She was? Yeah. So I, I, I grabbed the knife and I stabbed her. And that's like the trouble. There was blood everywhere. And the reason I told you is because... Understood. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's part of uh, the trust. Yeah, the trust relationship. Part, I appreciate you know. that. So I don't, I don't know how well... You could you could hear that, Aaron, but it's um, he pretty quickly and candidly came out with the fact that he brutally murdered someone in a restaurant in a convenience store, you know, a couple of years prior. And this is actually what I find the strangest part of the whole thing. No, no, I mean, the Mr. Big stuff is all wild, but I was, you know, as you're as you're kind of uh, reflecting back on this whole thing, you're and you're kind of starting to do a little bit of research about it. I'm wondering to myself, why did he do it, right? Because um, you know where it's where it's coming to him in the end, and then to hear him describe, well, I I just kind of blacked out, and then and then I, I you know came to later on, and I killed her. But not in those words, but that's kind of how he describes it, and that's the only kind of motive that that you get from him is you don't really get this kind of detailed explanation or you know it's just i, bla I blacked out <laughs> so to get back to the story they they getting back to that hotel room there so strobridge tells them all that happened they um basically shake hands with the agreement to talk soon and you know he's going to join the family he's probably leaving there thinking his life is uh going to change for the better uh, however, it doesn't. Very shortly later, he's arrested by the Toronto and the Cape Breton police who are there waiting for him. Um, he is now brought into the police station in Toronto, brought into a small interrogation room where he is going to be interviewed by or interrogated, I guess, by um, the the chief or the lead investigator uh, of the Big Ben's murder who came up from Cape Breton to to do this and. This interrogation, I also have a bit of audio from it that I'm going to play, but I just, um, I couldn't help but laugh at how easily and calmly the interrogator uh, just blows Strobridge out of the water, so to yeah. speak. Do you remember uh, being at the hotel last night? Yeah. In Toronto, do you remember talking to a guy by the name of Bob Deasley? Do you remember telling them that you uh, killed a lady at uh, Big Ben's on Prince Street in Sydney? I don't recall that. You don't recall telling them that? It's on videotape. Oh, you can see his, you can smell his wheels turning in his head when, when he confronts him. Like, you said you killed this girl in the hotel room. Like, I didn't say that. Or like he's just trying to think so quick on the spot. But what can you say? Like when you've been videotaped saying it in a hotel room, what can you possibly do about that? And it was the night prior. Like he must know he's so busted. Um, oh, he's done. Yeah, he's like I'm done. But is there anything I can say here that could squeak me out of this? Yeah, his yeah his gears are turning, but they're just like it's almost like his brain is just like a car with summer tires spinning on a sheet of ice. Like yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. He's not getting anywhere. He very quickly breaks down crying. Oh, he does. Yeah, and admits the whole thing. It doesn't mean that I don't I don't regret it. It doesn't mean that I don't feel bad. It doesn't mean that I'm not human. It doesn't mean that, that I don't feel bad for family. It doesn't mean that... Listen, buddy. I know, that you feel, I know that you're human. And it's a pretty big burden for a young guy like yourself. I know that. You know, this one is fairly cut and dry, like you say, in terms of the DNA evidence that they have and the, the way he confesses and... and and then afterwards, when he's interrogated, it's it's very obvious he's the guy that did this. Yeah, they have they have everything. They have his DNA on the scene. They um, 
that when he descri- when he confesses to the Mr. Big uh, character, he describes the murder weapon that knife having used it. It you know it's they had they have him. He's living right there at the time. There's there's really it's a slam dunk case. He has nothing to do but plead guilty to second degree murder. Uh, it avoids a trial, but it does still earn him a life sentence. But in kind of a cruel twist. Uh, which we'll get some comeuppance for shortly. But in a cruel twist, uh, he was a a juvenile at the time of the crime. So a life sentence, he would have had the opportunity to have parole within seven years. So it it would have been a very light sentence, uh, having committed this crime as a juvenile. But, you know, one thing I think about, like when you commit a crime as a juvenile, but then as an adult, continue to like cover your tracks and hide from it, it almost like should cancel out the fact that you're a juvenile because you're kind of still doing it as an adult. Do you ever think about that? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like it's so complicated to think like that kind of a violent crime. You can't just chalk it up to, Oh, I was young and stupid. There's obviously something else going on there. Seriously wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Something is, is disconnected there that you could commit a crime that violent um apparently in a blackout state like there's something is going on but and and i don't know how to how to delve deeper than that but it's it's i feel like it's so hard for me to even like some of the I, i can't put myself in the shoes to even be able to say really i've been in positions where i was with a group of friends and we were doing something stupid and we just kind of fed off each other and it just went too far. But, and you know, and we could have gotten in big trouble, but that's a lot different than, you know, what he did. So what, what he did, you know, this brutal murder, that's, um, I, I don't know. I kind of, I, I felt, I initially felt really bad for her surviving husband, Doug Dupe and the rest of their family to have, you know, all this time go on and then to get, you know, a life sentence about parole, possibly in seven years. I felt that that wasn't justice, but some people, and I'm not going to say I feel this way, but some people feel that justice found its own way to be carried out where he was, er, um, Strobridge, he was arrested September of 2002. He went to prison, uh, where not long after my understanding is he became very ill while in prison and um, February 27th, 2013 at the age of 37, he met his end at the, uh, at a prison in Edmonton. I've never heard what actually killed him other than it was natural causes. So I'm kind of left thinking, you know, cancer or something like that. Mm -hmm. I uh, I was going to ask you if you knew, because from everything I read, all it said was natural causes, but then it would say he's 37 years old. So you think, you know, what is, is that really natural causes? Yeah. It's, it has to be something that. like cancer, but it wasn't it seven years after, like, wouldn't he been up for parole right around then? Yeah. But maybe, I don't know. I don't know a lot about his legal kind of activity in the prison and his parole hearings and whatnot, but this would have been, he would have been eligible for parole before the point that he died. And if he was really sick, that may have given him a better case to get out on parole. So I don't really know. I'd like to see some of his records as to what happened in prison with his parole and whatnot. But, and again, like cancer is just a guess. I'm I'm only saying that because at 37, if someone says a natural cause, I'm thinking like a sickness, a 37 year old, all I could really think of is cancer, but you never know. There's a lot of things. Yeah, it could be something that he's had since birth that finally, you know. Uh, maybe caught up with him. Who knows? Yeah, it's it's such a kind of when you read the articles or the you know the the newspaper clippings, it's like, and he died of natural causes in jail, and it's and it's just kind of left at that. But it but it raises questions like, well, natural causes. He's thirty seven, you know, he's in jail for this horrific murder. It's it's all kind of like just leaves you kind of wondering what really happened in there. Yeah, and I think, uh, like, I'm not going to celebrate the guy's death because we don't know. I'm I'm sure he had a troubled life. Like, I don't think you end up, this doesn't become your life when you're raised with a, 
you know, with uh, all the benefits that the fortunate few have. So who knows what his childhood and what struggles he had. But but a lot of people believe in the death penalty, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who thought he should have gotten it for, for this crime. But, uh, yeah, I think in the in the end, um, I guess I'm left conflicted other than to say that um, I'm just glad that technology caught up to – caught up to him before Doug Duke managed to pass away. Like at least he was alive. At least he and, gets that to kind of have that closure that I'm sure he was probably, you know, always living without. Yeah. And I'm sure he was always living in a bit of a, a shadow of suspicion too, because although the police cleared him, I'm sure there were people like, I remember in the years after this, this murder, like I remember hearing people talk about, the, the big Ben's murder and just mention the fact that the husband was, you know, or the, or they were involved in organized crime. Like I remember hearing that way after he would have been ruled out as a suspect. So I'm sure he had people close to him kind of watching him from the corner of their eye, his whole life. And then, you know, and, and then at the same time, it must've been such a huge shock when he got that phone call saying, you know, we got the guy. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure there's even still people that would say that guy who killed her was probably hired by some organized, you know, some some mob kind of, uh, you know, hit or something like that. You know, maybe he was paid to do that or something like who knows. But, you know, because like you say, those rumors in a small town never truly go away. And I'm sure there's probably some some pretty strange rumors still circulating yeah. about this case. Hell yeah. And there's, you know, there's 10 times as much spreading rumor as there is, you know, considering the validity of the components of the rumor. So yeah, it's like things can get wild, but regardless, this crime, the big Ben's murder will go down as, you know, one of Cape Breton, one of Sydney's darkest moments uh, in 1992, the year of the Big Ben's murder, as well as the McDonald's murder, is easily Cape Breton's most horrific year. Those two crimes will forever be remembered by by people who, who lived through them. Uh, not to mention the fact that for probably a year after the McDonald's murders, before they managed to catch up to the people responsible for that, there was a lot of dis a lot of discussion about whether they were both connected and there was, you know, some kind of serial killer. Or something. Yeah, that's like, right. Yeah. I, I remember all that because they were searching for the McDonald's murders, the McDonald's murderers, just as the Big Ben's investigation was still happening. So, you know, both appeared to be sort of like robberies, although nothing was stolen from Big Ben's. But it's... um. Yeah, that was an interesting time, and I'll always remember my granddad telling me about showing up. Yeah, this is kind of weird. I didn't, I didn't say this at the beginning, but my granddad, again, was one of the first on the scene of the Big Ben's murder, like showing up just after the cops, which is kind of nuts. But my granddad's son, my uncle, he worked at the McDonald's that the murders happened in. He just wasn't working that night. And my granddad lived just around the corner from one of the victims of the McDonald's murders. So it's like during 92, I would have been 11. Like all this stuff was like, you know, right in my neighborhood. And even within my family with my uncle being involved in the McDonald's murders. But again, fortunately not being there that night. It's just, it's kind of nuts. It, oh yeah. It was, it's, and, and again, you're talking about two uh, very violent uh crimes occurring in such a short span of time um, in an area where we really weren't used to, to hearing about those, those types of crimes happening at all. And then to have them happen in such a, uh, you know, so close to each other, it was really overwhelming to the community. Yeah. And it's, it's still big news. I, um, this story, the story of the Big Ben's murders or murder is easily among the most requested topics on nighttime. I get people from Cape Breton almost whenever I hear from them, uh, people who listen from Cape Breton, this is the story. They'll be like, are you ever going to do one on the Big Ben's murders or murder? Um, I, I get that so often. And I kind of thought about different ways to do it and and whatnot. But I thought like in the end, I think this is the way to do it me and you just talking it through because the story the story's fascinating it's tragic 
It's interesting. And it, it really like what I think is it gives a bit of a snapshot of that period of time. DNA, you know, becoming a thing and cracking this oh, case. Yeah. Like, and the Mr. Big component of it is to me is, you know, we're from this small town um, where, you know, this infamous uh, kind of uh, undercover or, you know, a, a, a undercover scenario that the RCMP uses, um, you know, it's it's a world famous kind of um, way to, to capture a confession. It's not used very much anymore because of how controversial it was. I think the Supreme Court actually ruled that it can't be used anymore unless like a confession from Mr. Big Sting can't be used in court anymore unless they can truly prove that the suspect um, wasn't manipulated whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And and I think a few cases either have been thrown out or are close to getting mm -hmm. new trials. But at, oh, the, yeah. at the same time, it gets results. Like this case, I don't know how they would have been able to to do it without, without the confession. Because again, DNA of him at the store doesn't, doesn't equate to him killing her. Um, no, it doesn't. It only places him at the scene. This is one of the cases where the Mr. Big uh, sting operation does in fact work, but there, there's a lot of them that, that people to this day are saying, you know, that person didn't do it or, you know, they're still in jail. Um, there, there's a lot of Mr. Big Sting operations that are incredibly controversial and um, it, are the reason that they it doesn't get used very much at all anymore. But that's why I think the investigation in the evidence against them, it needs to be multifaceted. Like in this case, mm, absolutely. Yeah, they yeah. have the DNA on the scene, which puts them there. They have his his confession, which all adds up. They have the, the woman who bought the sub at 318 describing someone who sounds a lot like him. So all the things together tell a story. If the only thing they had was the Mr. Big thing or the only thing they had was the DNA that I'd like they should. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It no. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why this one again is the quintessential Mr. Big sting operation because they have the eyewitness, the DNA, and then they lock it all together with the confession and it works that way. And he, and he um, pleads guilty, which is telling. It shows that, you know, that mm -hmm. he likely had some legal advice saying like, they got you, man. Yeah. But I can imagine a lot of pressure being put on the investigators who are conducting the Mr. Big operation. Like, this is a cold case. You need to lock this down. You need to get this confession by any means necessary. There could be a bit of pressure going on, too. Like, this guy's not confessing. What can we do to get him to confess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. And they would be, they would have pressure. And also, they would be, they would have likely met the family, saw the evidence. And, you know, and it's like, I, I get why cops may feel, or investigators may feel the pressure to, push push it to the limit it's just yeah, especially it's, if it's your only avenue that you have now mm -hmm. this is the only suspect we have we've got enough evidence to maybe with a confession lock this in let's get it done yeah, and close this thing yeah it's such a, a complicated and delicate situation i can't imagine the pressure the stress of trying to, and then just the operational resources to be able to pull these stings off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's um, I I'll tell you, I'd love to do it though. It would be stressful, but if I was a, like a cop, I'd love to be doing this. I'd sort love of thing. to be. Like, I'd love to be Mr. Big. Um, I'd love to play the. Uh, well, you got the theater background. You would. The problem though is you would come across as like a lunatic, Mr. Big. I could see you <laughs> over overacting it. Well, no, I would play it very subtly. Um, yeah, no, I would, uh, I would take, take that very seriously. I, I just picture like them send them, send them in a room and you're there like dressed like the most stereotypical, like mobster a or pinstripe pimp or something. suit with a Tommy gun in the corner and <laughs> it's an ant, eh? <laughs> I'm Mr. Big. I mean, yeah, well, let's end it with that. But Aaron, I'm so glad you joined me for this, man. I couldn't have told the story without you and it's uh, always a, a privilege to spend time with you and collaborate with you on this sort of thing yeah thanks for having me on this was a really fun one to uh to help out with especially because uh that store it's a it's an iconic store in our in our community and they have a lot of flavors of ice cream oh and popcorn um really good it smells like popcorn when you walk in
I want to thank you for joining Aaron Corbett and I in this discussion surrounding one of our city's most horrific events. It's just incredible how much horror can be unleashed for such pointless reasons, or in this case, it seems it was inflicted for no reason at all. And with that, we'll end this episode of Nighttime. But before we part, I want to end with some thanks. First, a huge thank you to Aaron for joining me on this episode. Aaron, like I said, it's an honor to collaborate with you. Now, for anyone out there who wants more on this story, check out the links I've added to the show notes. They'll direct you to two great documentaries about this case. But if you simply want more nighttime, let me tell you about the premium feed. For about the price of a cup of coffee, you can access ad-free early releases of the episodes, as well as the Nightcap After Show, in which I and a guest climb a bit deeper down the rabbit holes. You can access the premium feed by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, I want to thank the new members to the supporter group. Doug, Jeremy, Angela, Joseph, Natalie, and Fred, thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else out there who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and by leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you use. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on or off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. And if you have any story ideas or want to give some feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. Now until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.